Um, so at this time, we're going to get a, the perspective of professors and people who have actually worked with these students. So please welcome Professor Timothy Saviolo, Ramon Alvaredo, Alvaredo, and Brooke Antonio. I practiced as a public defender in Georgia and Louisiana and a variety of state and federal courts for 17 years and never thought of myself as a teacher until this program was developed. And I came to realize after talking with John, who I'd known and worked with for many years in his nonprofit, uh, you'll see the fruits of that if you stay around for the film, which I highly suggest you do because it's wonderful. Um, I came to realize that the reason I was a public defender could translate to being a law professor through this program. That is, that we could develop conscientious lawyers to go out in the criminal justice world uh, and practice law the way it needs to be practiced uh, and change the system from the bottom up because changing it from the top down is simply not working. So that's how I came to be a professor uh, and this is my second year at John Marshall and I love it. It's fantastic and uh, the students can tell you how much joy we take in it and we do have a lot of fun in the classes. Uh, at the same time we work to prepare them for the rigors ahead and before these gentlemen get in to talk about their work experience with our product, uh, let me just say that I want to focus a little bit on the way the curriculum is set up. And you had some great questions for the students about the workload and, and speaking specifically about the Honors Program curriculum. It's designed so that at the end of your second year, you can go out in an externship or an internship, either in the summer after your second year or in the third year, and produce value for employers. That is, you can show up in an office and know the black book law that you need to know about criminal justice system, criminal procedure, criminal law, evidence, which is one of my passions. You'll really know evidence if you come to my class. But then you can actually do something for those employers. Because of the integrated practice class that you take in second semester, second semester, second year, you will have taken a case, you will have worked through the pretrial process, you will have done pretrial litigation, and you will have done a mock trial in that case. So when your employer says, hey, we need to do a suppression motion, you know immediately where that fits in. You've already been through that. And they say, we need a motion in limine to keep this piece of evidence out. You've done that. We need to prepare this witness cross-examination. We need to make sure your cross is going to fit with my closing. You've done all of that. And so in your third year of law school, you are essentially practicing law so that when you graduate and you actually go out and pass a bar and get a license and go practice, you are a year ahead of anyone else in terms of your actual practical experience. And that's what I found so fascinating about the program. Because I went to a big named law school, and when I came out of law school, I didn't know anything about how to actually practice law. And I had a great diploma that looks really nice on my wall, and then I started to learn how to be a lawyer. And so this program is really wonderful because it takes you a year ahead of that. And so in your third year, if you're in this program, you can practice law, not without a license, let's be clear about that, but you can actually provide value uh, to employers. So when they take an intern or an extern from this program, after their second year, they know that they're getting something, someone who can actually produce work, and they want, they'll want they tell you, I'm sure, about how they want to uh, influence them as well, but they can get something back from them. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. So we'll let these gentlemen talk, and then we'll take as many questions as you have. My name is Brooke Antonio. I'm with the Public Defender's Office here in Fulton County. I actually work with uh, Alexandria. Um, I've been, I am a young lawyer. Um, I'm only two and a half years out of law school, uh, just been practicing. And let me say, this program that they have here, I mean, I talked about it a little bit with Alex um, when I worked with them, but I didn't understand really what they do until I sat here and watched this. And I wish that we had something like this uh, when I was in law school. Mm -hmm. Even if you're just interested in criminal law, um, the tools that you get um, the stuff that, that they're teaching, that they're learning, is fantastic. I mean, when I graduated from law school, and I, I still am learning, but I, I feel like I went back to school again. I got done with school, and I was like, man, I got to go back to school. I don't know anything. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how the procedure works. But you're learn it seems like they're learning that here. And uh, working with Alex, I mean, she was just the 1L, but the understanding that she had of what we were doing, what we were fighting for, um, how the process worked, she understood that better than most of my three years that I had from big name schools that I work with uh, as interns. And I wish I could have gave her some cases. Unfortunately, she didn't have a third year practice, so I couldn't give it to her like I wanted to. But if she comes back again next summer, she'll definitely have some cases. Um, so it just helps prepare you um, for the real world, for what you're really going to be doing uh, out here. Good morning. I'm Ramon Alvarado. I have a law practice out in Lawrenceville, Georgia. 
Um, it's just me. I'm in an office with some great attorneys. We're sharing office space, but it's just my law practice. Um, I'm also a young attorney. I've been doing this for eight years. Um, John has ruined things for me. This program has ruined things for me because I can't have anybody else work for me now that hasn't gone through this program that I can't just hand a file to and say, listen, we've got a trial coming up in three weeks and I need you to start prepping this. I don't have that luxury with other people that I bring into my office. So it's great to have somebody like Michelle there that I could hand a file to that could write briefs, put together motions, and she knows what she's doing. It, it's a great feeling because it frees me up to do so many other things, knowing that I could trust somebody there at the office to do some of these things that I need. Um, I love my job. I love my life. And I'm really excited for all of you guys because you guys are just in the beginning. I'm, I'm envious. It, it's it's a great ride, and if this is truly what you want to do, there's no better place than here. And you're in for just an amazing experience. So, surely there's some questions. And, and feel free, I'll speak candidly about my class, and I'll tell you, I teach uh, criminal procedural, criminal law evidence. Uh, I've created and teach a criminal law ethics class. Uh, which you guys, although you're going to D.C., so you're going to have to get a plane ticket, but we'll have Mom come and, and speak at. This is designed, and it's an elective class, but it's specifically for folks that are going to go practice criminal justice and want to know about the ethical considerations uh, of practicing criminal law because they are very different than the ethical considerations from practicing civil law. Uh, so I teach a lot of different things. I come at it uh, from my own perspective, but I'm happy to answer any questions about any and all uh, of those classes. So please, somebody, come up with something. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. How many students are in the honors program? In the first year, uh, Alex and uh, Michelle's class, there are 14. And uh, so I say the first year, that is, they're in their second year now. That was the inaugural year of the program. The next year has 10 students. Uh, and so, you know, they can speak probably. We heard some discussion about the class size. So when they're in, in their individual honors classes, for instance, the integrated practice class now, uh, just has the 14 honor students. When they take evidence, uh, they are in the larger class, so they're subsumed into the general student population, uh, but they all sit together, uh, and they all ask questions together, and they have inside jokes together. So, so the class size will depend on, on enrollment. Uh, there's some limits. Professor Rapp can probably tell what the top end limit would be, um, but it's going to be your, your experience with the honors program will be a small group experience. And that's one of, one of the reasons is because you get a much richer experience in those issues by having that environment. How many students from the, from the law school are part of the honors program, I guess? Is well, it'll just be whoever's in the honors program. So there are, you know, 130 or so students in a class, uh, and then 10, 15, 20 in the honors program. So, yeah. Here's something I want to stress. Um, when I went to law school, I was up in Wisconsin, went to, went to Wisconsin for law school out of state, came down here, knew I wanted to do criminal defense. That's when the learning process for me started, was after law school, um, I met Professor Rapping, I went through a program with him, and I started to learn how to become a public defender and how to do everything I needed to do to be a good defense attorney. And the advantage that you guys are going to have is that you're starting that process earlier than most people are ever going to start that process. I mean, I could tell you right now, and I hope this doesn't go to her head, I think Michelle's probably more on top of it than a lot of the attorneys I see out in Gwinnett County who have been practicing for a couple of years. I mean, she's got more passion. Um, she has a better idea of what the law is, and, and she has a better life view of a case, like she can assess a case. And, and that's something I'm sure she was born with a lot of that, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of that also came from this program and, and the professors and the other students. Um, I work as an advocate for CASA in the county where I live, and I've been doing that for three years now. And um, I pay 
close attention to the attorneys and the judges that are within my county because um, it's a learning experience. And but um, you you got you guys are um, are consistently speaking about changing the system. Um, I see a lot of lackadaisical lawyers. Um, how I mean, how do you propose to change the system? I mean, what are what are what are some ideas? I mean, what what do you think? I mean, well, I the, the if there is a larger theory and goal, um, it's the idea that. And Professor Rapkin has done a lot of research in this area. So the criminal justice system is broken um, simply because we have, we as a community, and then we as participants in the system, have come in many ways to accept what we should not accept. Accept excessive caseloads, accept low quality work, uh, accept low pay, all these sorts of things. And that's become the standard. And simply by facing that year after year after year, everyone has come to accept that. So when you speak about lack of days for lawyers or lawyers not putting forth the effort, um, it would be our experience that that is a result of low expectations. Uh, and attempts to try to change that from the top down are going nowhere because that essentially costs money. You see Clarence Earl Gideon uh, wrote a letter on prison stationery to the Supreme Court and said, you know, I feel like I ought to have a lawyer. I don't know what I'm doing, and that doesn't seem right. And so the Supreme Court came down with the mandate, yes, you should have a lawyer, and then if you follow anything about politics these days, you know what an unfunded mandate is, right? Here's the great big idea from on high, and then the idea is go forth and do it. Well, it costs money. And so as a society, we have to adjust uh, there's only so much money to spend without getting into a whole political lecture. Society has decided that criminal, the criminal justice system needs just the bare amount of money, uh, the bare minimum. And so by changing it from the bottom, what we mean by that is get lawyers, prosecutors and defenders in the system who say, you know what, the status quo is unacceptable because that's not why I'm a lawyer. That's not what I came to do. So you are very much trying to um, change it through the educational system? Sure. From, from, from the bottom. Okay, I get it. And so if the lawyers, the prosecutors and defenders go out and join an office or start practicing on their own and go in front of a judge as a sole practitioner six months out of law school, and the judge says, hey, this is how we do things here. And then the lawyer, hopefully, from John Marshall from this program, will be empowered to say, well, judge, there's this thing called the Constitution. And the Constitution says that that is really not how we're going to do it. And I represent my, you know, and, and one by one, moment by moment, building that from the bottom up, and we've seen it through Professor Rapping's program that's featured in the film. We have seen changes in jurisdictions because lawyers, young public defenders, learn through this program and become empowered that way and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And you can yell at me, you can scream at me, but you can't fire me because you're not my boss. And then judges will capitulate eventually. And then the culture within that one little jurisdiction, that one little courthouse in you know, Coweta County, will change. And little by little, that's how it's going to change. But more importantly, what Dean Lynn and what John said is that we here at John Marshall want to teach you how to become real lawyers. And by that, we mean people who go out and practice law with the idea of doing good. What Dean Lynn quoted uh, his friend, uh, I can't remember the name, but that lawyers are there to help people. They serve a need. People in need come to lawyers to make themselves whole, to right wrongs, both on the prosecution and the defense side. And if an ethical lawyer who has the skills to do it treats it that way, then the system will be better. It's when we capitulate and become processors, and when the system says, well, we don't pay attention to the individual needs, the individual client, the individual victim, but we're just cranking through so we can process enough cases so we can justify our budget and lose sight of the humanity of it. That's where we are now, and that's how we're going to change it. It is really, really sad but when you get out into the, into the real world, you're going to be surrounded by lackadaisical attorneys. I mean, that's just the way it is out there. Um, but I really think you just need to make these changes that we're all trying to, to achieve just one case and one client at a time. And you'll have judges who, when you first walk into that courtroom, treat you like dirt. But once they see you're going to stand up to them, and every time you go into that courtroom, you're going to do everything you can for your client, you'd be amazed at how even the toughest judges just get it. I mean, they're going to get that, okay, Mr. Alvarado's coming into court. This is how it's going to be. And I think it starts with, uh, just to piggyback 
it starts with events like this. It starts with uh, teaching young lawyers um, the right way to do things, um, like with Professor Rapping's program, um, the uh, Gideon's Promise. Uh, that's also something that people in our office go to. They learn. We have a group of attorneys that I came in with um, that we have a different culture than some of the older attorneys, but a lot of them went through that program, uh, and a lot of them understand what's going on. So things with the younger attorneys are changing than it was with the older attorneys. So it, it just starts, as I said, it starts from the bottom. It starts from learning young. Um, and not just jumping into the same cycle. And you always have to remember there are other attorneys out there like you who have the same passion, and maybe in your courtroom it doesn't feel that way, or if you're isolated in a PD's office in a specific place and it, it doesn't feel that way. But the great thing about these different programs is, is you all get together, and there are a lot of good organizations where you could go and, and meet with other attorneys just like you and get re-energized and recharged. And, and on that note, I'll say, and, and students will uh, hopefully back me up, is my experience with the honors classes is how close they have become as a group. And I, I feel absolutely certain that when they go out and practice and spread out, they will be calling each other. And if they're having a down day or they have an issue that comes up in a case and they can't figure out how to handle it, um, if they're not calling their professors, which I certainly hope they are, because this is still great fun for us. I mean, we do this. I've done it for so long because we love it. Um, that they'll call each other and bounce ideas off each other because coming through this program, you guys will, uh, will develop a relationship within your group uh, that will last well beyond law school. And so you'll have that network wherever you go practice. Um, and these days, communication is you know, instantaneous worldwide, right? It's, not, it's different than it used to be, certainly when I came out before email. Imagine that, law school with no email and no online research. I'm dating myself, but it's true. Um, so that'll be part of it, too. That's another big part of the program, is that by having you guys uh, work as a cohesive unit and, and take your classes together, we create that culture and that, fond, that bond that will go beyond school, and you'll find some support there. So, yes, sir. Um, Dean Lynn talked a lot about uh, some of the misconceptions in practice. I know you got two guys that one's in public service and one has private practice. How is practice, practice actually in terms of um, what do you guys spend the bulk of your time doing as, as lawyers? One thing that I learned after law school that law school doesn't teach you is that they don't teach you how to deal with the client, mm -hmm. the person that's mm -hmm. sitting there across from you. They don't teach you how to deal with the person's family. I mean, a big part of my time is communicating with people. And I may ultimately, in the end, have the same message another attorney would have for that person, for that client. But you have to understand, you have to start in the very beginning. And the way you communicate that message and walk people through and explain the situation to them makes a huge difference. So communicating with clients and, and their family, that's a big part of what I do. And you know, I'll say the same thing, being a public defender, um, initially, there's a misconception that we don't do anything. We're not on your side. We're not working on your case. So the bulk of the beginning of what we do is I'm trying to gain trust with my client. And I do that through sitting with them, communicating with them, uh, explaining the law to them. Uh, and I, you know, then we go out and we do investigations. And in doing investigations, we bring it back to them and say, hey, this is what I found. This is what's going on. This is what I think. So it's, it's always brought back to them so we can build that trust, build that understanding and then be able to you know, help move them on with the case and get the best results you can get. Yeah, this job would be easy if we just walked into court with the file and you just got to argue. The difficult part of the case is that 90% of the time outside of the courtroom that you're trying to build those relationships. And one thing we talk about in the program is humanizing the system, and that's both for the defendants and the victims. And there are many prosecutors uh, who have a victim liaison in their office not as a person specifically in the prosecutor's office who deals with the victim and the victim's family. And what that really does is insulate the prosecutor from any emotional responsibility of, of dealing with the people who've been victimized if there's a crime. And many lawyers try not to deal with their clients as human beings uh, because it's hard, right? But if you love human interaction, if you love the human condition, I can't imagine doing anything but criminal practice. Uh, everything else seems like numbers to me. Numbers on paper and contracts and transactional law, one corporation and uh, it gives me the highs. 
But criminal, criminal practice is about human interaction. And what they're speaking about, the term we use, is client-centered representation. And that applies, as I teach in an ethics class, both to prosecution and to defense. And it's easy in defense. You have a client, you need to treat that person as a human being because their experience, how they experience being charged and prosecuted, uh, depends in great uh, measure upon how you treat them as an individual. On the same side in prosecution, somebody has been victimized. Maybe it's greater society, but then theoretically it can be the community. Uh, how big of community? It can be one individual person. There's all different ways to look at it. But prosecutors as well need to think about that, about humanizing the victim and identifying that and treating that as they practice uh, and how they approach the case. Um, but that's all about human interaction. What these guys say, the vast majority of your time is spent dealing with the human emotion of it. Uh, and if it's done well, then the best result can be obtained from both sides. But if it's ignored, that's when you see problems. And if you go to court, I always say too, and my students will hear this just about every week, it can be just as valuable to see bad lawyering for a young lawyer as it is to see good lawyering. If you see bad lawyering and know that it's bad, you get a visceral thing in your soul that says, I do not want to be that lawyer. Right? And you remember that. Some of the best lessons I ever learned that I still remember were from watching bad lawyering. And that often comes up at the end when they haven't spent the time and engaged with the client. And the client feels finally at the moment of truth, I have to plead, I have to go to trial, that I haven't been represented because I haven't spent any time with this person. And then the lawyer gets embarrassed because now their failures have been brought to light and it's just ugly. Whereas if you, if you spend the time uh, treating the client like a human being and earn their trust, uh, then, then the process works much more closer to the ideal. What are some uh, ethical dilemmas that you've run into in practice of criminal law? And I'd like to hear from Professor Rapping as well. Well, um, I'm actually on the investigative panel for the State Bar of Georgia. So I look at files, um, complaints that people make about attorneys. Um, it seems like the big issue people seem to have nowadays, attorneys, that seems so obvious to me, are conflicts. I mean, I keep seeing attorneys represent people where there's an obvious conflict with a witness or they spoke to somebody they shouldn't have spoken to. Um, and that's a big problem right now in Georgia and in the PD's office. So that's a big issue that I see. Um, I guess some of the ethical issues that we dealt with, as they talked about before, the big caseloads. I'll have anywhere at a time, because we work in Fulton County in, in the division I'm in, we have anywhere from um, 50 to 80 clients at a time. It's a nine-week cycle that we go through that we handle. So from arrest to trial, we're supposed to deal with all of those people in that amount of time. So sometimes I struggle with, you know, how much do I work on this case versus this case? How much, you know, how much time should I spend on this case versus spend time on this case? Should I talk to this witness or spend time on this one? It just gets a little hectic sometimes. And then when you get to a spot where it's time to plead and you, have, you don't feel like you've done everything that you could do for that client, that particular person, and, you know, they're like, I want to plead. And you're like, well, I don't know if you should plead. You know, you, you kind of struggle with I struggle with that sometimes um, ethically on, you know, what we should do when they're like, hey, I just want to get out of jail. I'm begging you, let's just get out of jail. And I'm like, I don't think you should plead. Let's, let's do a little more investigation. And you'll see that, that in many ways these are systemic problems, right? The, the high caseload means that you can't spend the amount of time on a case that you should and that you know you should. And that's one of the struggles of young lawyers is how to balance that because, of course, you've got to keep your job, right? You can't go to your boss and say, well, I'm only taking three cases this year because then I can really <laughs> work well on these three cases, right? And then you'll be unemployed. Uh, so there's that balance, and it's an ethical dilemma, and essentially um, some people theory that it's malpractice to continue to work in that system. As a practical reality, you can't take that approach. You have to do the best you can in the environment you are that you're in and that you practice in, but there's ways to do it. Educate your supervisor if your supervisor feels that you should be able to handle more, because back in the day, I pled 400 people in a day, and that's how we used to practice. All right? If that's your supervisor, that supervisor needs some re-educating. Or if it's a judge, and judges, of course, are elected officials, uh, and they get elected or they get challenged in election in large part upon their ability to move cases. A judge can be weak for generally two reasons. One, they had a big case uh, that was noteworthy where they didn't sentence somebody harshly enough. 
or when the end of the year caseload reports come out and one judge has moved 20% fewer cases than everyone else, they're gonna be challenged in the next election because they're not given justice by moving enough cases. So you have these tensions and it's, it's you know, many ways the biggest ethical considerations involve how to navigate those things uh, in a way that you can both go to sleep at night uh, and your clients also get the best representation you can. John. So, so and I'll chip in because I think they, they've covered quite a bit about the obvious ethical dilemma dilemmas that you can face as a, particularly as a public defender, where you can't say no to cases and caseloads can create some real ethical dilemmas. Can you live up to your ethical dilemma, ethical obligations to your clients with those caseloads? On the other side of the coin, and something I've been researching a lot and writing about, is what ethical dilemmas might face you as a prosecutor. And, and one thing that is absolutely clear is the prosecutor's duty is to justice, is to promote justice. And if you are in this program, you will spend a lot of time in your first year intro to criminal justice course talking about exactly what justice is and what the lawyer's obligation is to justice. Um, but if you're a prosecutor enter, entering a system with high caseloads and the pressures are to move those cases through the system, to force pleas, to clear dockets, and you feel like doing that isn't living up to your ethical obligation to justice, I think that's probably the biggest ethical dilemma that prosecutors face in this system of high caseloads, is how do I both deal with the caseloads and live up to my obligation to justice to really make sure I'm getting a just outcome. So on both sides of the coin, I think the caseloads create real ethical demands. Ian, in private practice, uh, do you have you ever said, hey, I quit the case, you, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do? You know, because people will let you down. You can say all day long, hey, we're going to do it this way. Listen, most people will let you down. <laughs> most people will let you down, whether it's a and prosecutor or a judge. It's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. Here's the way you have to look at it. Uh, another ethical issue, at least in private practice, a lot of attorneys will take a lot of cases for little money. Mm -hmm. And they try and bring in more cases to get that little bit of money to try and get the amount of money they want in the end. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of attorneys who will set up payment plans and once somebody misses a payment, I'm out of here. Oh, okay. I'm off the case. Mm -hmm. That's not the way you do it. Mm -hmm. All right. The way I look at it is if a person, if you're willing to make a payment plan for a person, that's on the attorney. Okay. If the person can't pay you, you don't just abandon them because they can't make the payments. Like I always take the point of view of you've got to continue representing them and, and, and do what you can. Um, I see a lot of attorneys just as soon as that payment is missed, see it as an excuse to not have to do that work and get out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something if you go into private practice, you're going to see a lot of. And that gets back to the idea that in the way we teach it here is that the law is a service profession. People come to you with problems, just like a doctor. You, if they are sick, they go to a doctor, sometimes to a specialist. And the law is the same thing. People come to you in need, and you serve that need, and you have an ethical obligation when you take on their burden to see it through to the end. And you're going to find yourself taking on cases even when people can't pay you, just because it's a, an interesting case or a good case or you want the trial experience. And I always encourage young attorneys, you know, don't turn down a case that comes in your door that you think might be a trial or something that you could get some experience out of. Yeah. And on, on the public defender side, sometimes you have a letdown um, when your clients may not give you all the information that you need or they may have lied to you about something and you find out you know, right in front of the judge, and you're like, oh, man, like, you should have told me that. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> but, you know, you take that second, you take a breath, and then you continue to fight for them and understand that there's still that perception that you're not on their side. But once they see that you are and you continue to fight, that's when they start changing. Their perception of you starts changing. So and it's, what happens when they write the bar on you? Listen, you're going to get bar complaints. <laughs> if you're an attorney, you're going to get a bar complaint eventually. And the state bar is pretty good at weeding out what's a legitimate complaint, mm -hmm. or if you haven't spoken to your client in two years, you probably should have picked up the phone and called them back. <laughs> I mean, they could weed that out. I mean, so don't worry about that. Just do the best you can. It's going to work out. Yeah. And remember, if you, if you spend the time on the front end developing a relationship with your client, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the key because it makes everything... They, then they develop the trust and the, and the defense aspect and the defense side of it, they develop the trust. Because when they first meet you, particularly if you're a public defender or appointed lawyer, there's no reason for them to trust you. They didn't hire you. They didn't choose you. You're being forced upon them. Right. 
So they're not going to trust you. You have to show them, as he says. We're, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. I'm going to go out and do investigation, bring it back. Then eventually they'll trust you enough to tell you the things you need to know. Um, and you build trust by doing what you say you're going to do. If right. you say you're going to call them, you give them a call. You don't forget to call them. If, if you say you're going to go visit them, you go visit them. Yeah. So, and we talk about all that stuff uh, in the honors program. Ad nauseum, maybe. A little too much sometimes, but it's very important to, to, so that when, when our graduates go out and start that process, um, they're empowered to think that way right from the start because uh, bad habits are harder to break, easy to form, hard to break. And if you start out with good habits and knowing that you need to treat clients and treat victims the same way if you're prosecuting, uh, then life becomes much simpler professionally for everybody. Any other questions? One last one. It seems like John Marshall is uh, setting the precedent for producing ready-made or practice-ready attorneys. Um, are other schools taking note of that, especially some of your top-tier law schools? And if not, why haven't they set the same precedent? Well, that's a great question. We could probably spend hours on it. If you read anything about legal education in the last year, um, you'll read about the idea that the, that the education model needs to change. And that comes essentially from the employer side. And the way the model used to work is big law firms uh, would hire a bunch of lawyers who didn't know anything, and they would learn how to do things as junior associates on cases. And then the clients would essentially pay for that education. So there'd be four junior associates working on a case, they would learn how to do things, eventually they would become senior associates and could actually do productive work. Well, as the economy went down, uh, people started paying attention to their legal bills, and they suddenly looked and said, what are, they, what are these guys doing on my case? They're not doing much. I don't need that. I, and so the market changed from the idea that people can learn how to practice on the back of the clients to the idea that employers now, and particularly clients, are saying, we want people who are going to work on the case. Thus, employers say, we want lawyers getting out of school who can actually do something. Uh, and so John Marshall, because of its focus on faculty who have practical experience, um, his, is in many ways ahead of the game. You're going to hear, if you do any research and read anything about legal education, you're going to see a large conversation going on about that. John Marshall, because of its focus on, uh, uh, on the practical faculty, and it's long been its focus to produce practice-ready lawyers, we're ahead of the game. Just The game has changed for many other folks, not for us. Um, and what Professor Rappin said, if you go look at the bios of our faculty, we're practicing lawyers who now teach. Some of us still practice on the side. And we take that practical experience because we've come to realize how important it is to be ready to practice sooner rather than later. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some other programs uh, that develop across the nation. Uh, maybe they're watching us to see how things go. Um, but we're the first, particularly with this criminal program. Right. And, and I would just tie that up by saying I think part of the reason why other schools aren't doing this is some, it's, our, it's, it's uniquely part of our mission, but also we're uniquely and I agree this word can be overused, but it's appropriate. We're uniquely qualified to do it because quite frankly, most schools don't have the faculty to do this sort of training. Right? They, they're classroom teachers, but they don't have a lot of practical experience. So, so I, I, I think other schools will take note. I'm not sure that they're gonna be able to get on the bandwagon because I don't know that they're gonna have the faculty to do it. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna just wrap this up though, but, but to let you know, we're. We're gonna to go to lunch in a few minutes and everyone will be around to, and, and we encourage you to continue to ask questions one-on-one um, -on -one, or we'll be sitting at your tables having lunch with you. Um, I also wanna encourage you to stick around till one o'clock when we are going to screen and this is really a unique opportunity. Um, there is a wonderful HBO documentary and let me just give you a couple minutes background on it. Uh, when one thing we do here at John Marshall is we try to make sure that our students never lose a commitment to being good lawyers. And, and that's reflected in the faculty that we hire. We hire faculty that have practiced and that continue to give back to the community and be very involved. I actually came to John Marshall not because I wanted to be a law professor. Right? That was never my goal in life. I came to John Marshall because it was a perfect marriage with what I had previously been doing. I started my career as a public defender in Washington, DC. I came to Georgia as the first training director for a new statewide public defender system, and that's where I met Ramon uh, when he was a, a young lawyer in Georgia. 
After that, I went to New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane, current Hurricane Katrina to help rebuild that office. And I started to see that all of these problems we've been talking about, that they're not isolated, they're everywhere. And so my response to that was to get a grant and build an organization that is called Gideon's Promise. It was called the Southern Public Defender Training Center. And we recruit, mentor, and train public defenders across the South. And, and I was starting that organization about the same time I was talking to Dean Lynn about coming here. And what I loved about John Marshall was the response was, we love what you're doing, this is a perfect fit. And so I've always felt like I had a real home here at John Marshall. About four years ago, a wonderful documentary filmmaker named Don Porter was looking for a project and she was talking to my program officer, the, the Gideon Promise program officer at the Ford Foundation and that program officer said, you need to go to Birmingham and see the work that they're doing with these amazing public defenders across the South. And we had a faculty, a, a, an amazing national faculty that included Professor Saviello, included Professor Fulcher, who's not here with us. And Dawn Porter came down and started filming and fell in love with what we were doing. And so she followed three young public defenders across Georgia and Mississippi and documented what they, what they do. And these are folks just out of law school. And it became this documentary called Gideon's Army. Gideon's Army premiered at the Sundance Film Festival this year and won the Best Editing Award. It's been getting accolades all over the country. It's been premiering at film festivals across the country. This week it's going to be at, at the Full Frame Film Festival in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, and it is going to screen on HBO in July. Outside of these film festivals and special previews, no one can see it except you. And so we're going to show it at 1 o'clock. I will stick around. Afterwards, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about the, about the documentary or the lawyers in the documentary, but I think it will give you a real good sense of how really courageous lawyers can do great work uh, where it really needs to be done. So I hope you all stick around till one, but either way, I'll see you at lunchtime. Okay, and thanks to our panel. That was wonderful.